All right. Hello and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale, the Real Seeker. And today I have uh, another special treat, another special treat for you guys. I'm joined by special guest, uh, Jamie. Uh, hey, Jamie, how's it going? Hi, Dale. Welcome to the show. Welcome Thank to the show. We've, we've been talking a lot with each other. Uh, we've been in, uh, kind of involved in a side project that I'll be talking about on my show next week a bit. But um, yeah, um, you know, welcome to the show. I wanted to invite you on to talk about various issues for, ranging from things like spiritual abuse, um, also your take on apologetics, and something that's kind of unique. I've never talked about it on my show, but this thing called disabled theology. So yeah, uh, just before I, we get into the topics, I want to turn it straight over to you. To Do you want to take some time to just introduce the audience as to who you are, a bit about your background, and maybe some stuff about your faith journey as well? Yeah, thanks, Dale. Um, I, I grew up in the church um, from an early age, went to Christian school, uh, Bible college. Um, the unfortunate thing, uh, from one perspective, is that the church I grew up, when, uh, grew up in was an independent fundamentalist church. So they're very legalistic, very abusive, um, and are really, really shunned the, the whole body of Christ. So that, that's the kind of background I grew up in. Um, as I was getting ready to graduate from Bible college, um, I became aware of some Bible teachers uh, on the radio that started doing series on spiritual abuse. And that sort of opened my mind up to a different perspective than what I grew up in, because it was very cult-like. Um, it's not what well, it's not considered a true lead with the truth, uh, but it's more their behaviors and some of their exclusive doctrines that they use to uh, control people. So that's sort of my background. Um, early on, uh, and and then I started. Uh, so that was probably thirty. I'm 54, so that was probably 30 years ago, uh, 32 years ago. Uh, and ever since, uh, we've supported people on a personal level uh, involved in cult-like churches, fundamentalist churches, independent churches. And that, then that sort of led me into disability theology because I worked with people with intellectual disabilities. And obviously, the two are sort of connected in, our, in an ironic way because uh, people with disabilities have experienced discrimination from the church, especially if their disabilities are, are physical or cognitive or intellectual. Yeah. And I can't hear you anymore. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh, something muted. happened there. <laughs> <laughs> I muted myself by accident. Um, okay. okay, cool. So, so I want to kind of transition into, let's look at that first topic this issue of spiritual abuse because this is so important today as, as you and i know kind of thing yeah. so, um do you want to just kind of take a couple seconds first of all can you explain okay look what is the difference what are the essentials of the true christian faith and what is the purpose of the real church supposed to be yeah um that's a great question i, I don't know if you want me to list all the essentials um i do have a website where they are they are listed at um, churchwatchdog.webador.com. So we actually list all the essentials. There's, qu there's quite a few because uh, there's doctrinal essentials, there's moral essentials of the Christian faith. Uh, but just to answer uh, briefly or generally, um, the difference between a good church or a bad church um, is the difference between independence and interdependence. Uh, when we look at the New Testament, the, the 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 New Testament churches were interdependent with each other for several reasons: for for accountability, for um, healthy doctrine, um, uh, for spiritual edification, um, and and so we we do see examples. For, for instance, in Third John, uh, where, where there is a church that became independent, and it ran into all kinds of problems where. They, they began to weaponize and abuse the scriptures. So uh, that's one area. The other area would be the difference between liberty and and uh, legalism, where um, legalism is, is going beyond what the scripture teaches, in some cases uh, taking away from the, what the scripture teaches. Uh, and we know that the Pharisees were notorious for that, right? They had over 600 rules that they made up 
in their own head uh, arbitrary personal rules that were not scripture and uh, Christ himself commands us not to follow the commandments of man as the commandments of God because if we do that then we're worshiping him in vain so we got to be careful that we don't make our personal opinions or convictions or preferences God's commandments right um, so that's another distinction uh, the Bible teaches us in Galatians that we're, we're called to be free in Christ um, now our culture would interpret that differently from how we would interpret it as believers we would interpret that as freedom from ourselves freedom from sin freedom from the letter of the law but also freedom from uh lasciviousness so that those are the two extremes right legalism and lasciviousness that can lead into abuse uh then the last one uh, distinction i would make is the difference between unity and uh uniformity um so uh, as a church the true church is supposed to be united uh, on the essentials of the Christian faith. Uh, the main essentials I would say are the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, or how we view salvation, right? Yeah. Um, then th there's people that try to pick and choose uh, certain doctrines that are non-essentials and make those essentials. So uh, we need to be very careful that we're united on the essentials and that we don't become sort of um, like cookie cutter, like Chuck Swindoll says, in, mm. in our approach to Christianity, where you know Dale prefers to use one version of the Bible, I prefer to use another. We we don't discriminate against each other on that basis, right? Or yeah. we might have different views on prophecy or eschatology, uh, and uh, we don't discriminate. There, there's room for for liberty. I forget who you might know who it is, Dale, who said that uh, on the essentials of the Christian faith, we should have uh, unity on the non-essentials. We should have liberty and in all things we should uh, have christian charity that would be the mark of a true church which no cult like church or traditional cults follow yeah yeah i think in the presbyterian tradition i know it's it's the doctrine of the liberty of conscience is what they call it that's okay. in yeah. the westminster confession for example yeah but, um just just one quick uh follow-up here it's not on the list of questions but I, i'm sort of curious because i i have a friend who's going towards the eastern orthodox church so you right. kind of mentioned the interdependency of the early church does that need to be some sort of like formal hierarchical uh process that has oversight in the church or do you think there's a role for independence but how do you see the interdependency kind of working in practice yeah that, that's a great question so the way I would see it is when we look at the apostles, like Peter and Paul and the other apostles, they sort of had oversight over the churches. They were the ones who called for the election of elders in the first place and then deacons. So uh, and they commanded others, their 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 workers to, to go out from city to city and elect elders. So it, it certainly appears from the New Testament. And we also know that the letters in the new testament were circular letters so all the churches read them so they weren't just for one individual church that there was accountability and we have all kinds of verses that allude to that where elders are supposed to be rebuked if they're sinning we are supposed to judge issues within the church um so so that gives us clear direction there's examples right there's examples also of, of paul if you can peter on legalistic issues of circumcision and then third john we have the example of the Apostle John, and I always get the guy's name wrong. It's uh, Di Diotropus, I guess. Di Di Diotrophes. There we go. I got it right. Diotrophes. <laughs> One of those. So past yeah, pastor. So this guy appears to be a pastor or elder or leader, um, and um, he's very divisive. He's not even accepting the, the disciples, right? Mm. Uh, and excommunicating people of the church. It also says there he's slandering people with malicious words, and Paul calls that evil. He says those that do evil don't know God. But on the other hand, he, he gives an example of another leader named Demetrius, uh, that this person was, was well spoken of by the church. So he wasn't exclusive. He wasn't elitist. He wasn't um, maligning other believers for mm -hmm. different reasons uh, or excommunicating people of the church. So we're, we're encouraged to have this sort of interdependence, accountability, uh, one with another. Unfortunately, um, we don't see that in practice uh, in the church today um, as much as we should. Uh, but to, to sort of close things out, I think that fellowships, Christian fellowships, um, 
would have an oversight today would sort of play the same role that the apostles played in in the first century but again not every church is under an official church fellowship right uh we've all heard stories of um um authoritarian pastors or leaders uh where they've been reported to their church fellowship and, and the president will step in and and remove them or, or rebuke them right so that's that's when things are working properly uh but in many cases um if the church is independent there is no church fellowship for accountability and then almost certainly uh they will they will um become cult-like in, in their practice not necessarily in their doctrine but in some cases the doctrines as well okay okay yeah. so you, you've kind of answered my next two questions obviously in contrast you know how, how do christians who maybe find themselves in a a cult-like environment uh kind of thing they they recognize some of the indicators that you've mentioned um and the lack of a true church church yeah. and pastor but at the same time they're an independent baptist church they they don't have mechanisms of appealing to some outside governing body or some outside source to kind of address yeah. that what should the christians in that kind of environment should they do it, it, do they just leave what you know what what's yeah. their response uh, i would recommend that they come together they document things they maybe possibly start an investigation they report the church to affiliations that they may be connected with and, th and then there's also if there's financial or charity law violations that they report those things to the government uh, so those are th some things they can do uh internally externally but i get i think the best mechanism is when the church is under a fellowship because that, that provides christian accountability and like the scripture says we don't need to get the unbelievers involved because that could create uh, a bad testimony so the church takes care of its own business in that sense where the president or the leadership of that fellowship would step in and, and rebuke uh the church that has gone astray or the pastor whatever the case may be gotcha all right cool so yeah um i'm gonna, about to transition to the apologetics thing but before i do is there, is there anything about uh, just so the audience knows, we, we do have a bit of a time limit, so that's why yeah. I'm kind of rushing. But is there anything about spiritual abuse that I haven't asked you about that you think is really important for the audience to know about? Or Yeah, well, there's so much on spiritual abuse. Actually, the Bible actually says quite a bit about it. Um, if you go to my website at churchwatchdog.webador, and webador is spelled W-E-B-A-D-O-R.com, uh, we got tons of information on there. There's scripture, there's uh, resources, uh, books. So there's people that have actually written on this subject, which is very interesting. That have experienced spiritual abuse. A lot of it uh, might be, a lot of it is is geared towards mega churches. Um, uh, there's, there's a fairly new book uh, called a church called uh, Tob Tob, which is the Hebrew or Greek word for good. Uh, written by, um, I think the guy's name is Brian McKnight with his daughter, and it's focusing more on the mega church uh, pastors and how how they sort of exploit uh, the church through absolute power as well, right? Um, so, but that gives you some ideas there. There's another book by Ronald Enroth called Churches That Abuse. That book is older, uh, but there's all kinds of other resources on my website that actually give you the, the, the warning signs. And interesting enough is, is the secular warning signs can be backed up by scripture. Um, even with the qualifications of a pastor, obviously, why do we have qualifications? Because not everybody's qualified, right? Uh, yeah. Just like if you apply at a secular job, you, you need to be qualified. You need to have the education, the experience. So not everybody's qualified to be a pastor. They don't have the spiritual, mental, uh, emotional uh, qualifications. So the Bible gives us the qualifications. And some of those qualifications are very interesting because they deal with abuse, overbearing, uh, controlling, right? Uh, someone that's in it for the wrong reasons, maybe, maybe for, for uh, personal gain, right? So um, th there's lots of scripture that we really can't get into now that sort of talks about uh, the right way and the wrong way to pastor a church, a healthy church versus an unhealthy church. Um, so if you go to church, watch, church watchdog, uh, dot web 
adore.com you can get lots of, lots of resources yep and for the audience i'll have that link on my blog as well as in the youtube uh video description so yep feel free to click on his website um okay so so let's transition at this point to my favorite topic apologetics uh so i know that you are a fan of apologetics as well but uh, do you want to first introduce uh, what, what's your understanding of what apologetics is? What's what's significant? What's yeah. valuable about it? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't consider myself an expert in apologetics, but I've uh, I have an interest in it. Um, and I think apologetics is directly connected to spiritual abuse. We're, we're defending the, the Christian faith. That's what it means. It's a defense of the Christian faith against um, human tendencies uh to abuse right so when we speak to for instance the new atheists they would be the first to attack christianity on the basis of the abuses of christianity uh, so the, i think the two are completely connected where um i i believe that um because god is perfect and holy and righteous he cannot abuse so obviously logically it's human beings are doing the abuse so we need to separate the two right so what part of the church abuses the human element, which part of the church cannot abuse is the divine element. So I think you need to separate the two. Um, when you have um, cases of abuse down through history, in every case, every single case, it, it's human beings. So really it has, in one sense, nothing to do with the church because people are using the church to abuse, but you can also use government, business, right, uh, relationships. So it's just human beings that are flawed uh, that are doing the abuse. In this case, they're using the mechanism of religion. But we all know that uh, the, the mechanism of government, especially uh, communistic or authoritarian governments, has had way more impact on abuse than the church has ever had. So um, if you want to compare the two, there's really no comparison, right? Secular abuse greatly outweighs, in my opinion, religious abuse. So that's a little bit of the connection between the two. Uh, apologetics is a defense of the Christian faith. Um, that's very, that was yeah. very interesting. I never yes. heard, uh, considered the link between spiritual abuse and apologetics before. So that yeah, there's also of... a link between disability theology because people with disabilities, many of them feel that the church has uh, rejected them, that they don't belong. They're not given the same opportunities because maybe they don't look like you and I, or they don't have the intellectual capacity. Um, um, they're not able to worship maybe in the same way you and I are able to worship. So yeah. the, there's, the, I think the three are linked together, apologetics in a funny way, uh, spiritual abuse, and, and then and then disabilities within the church. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, I never, I never put the pieces together like that before. So, okay, cool. Well, well let me ask you then straight up, um, do you think that there is good evidence for the truth of uh, that God exists, and that for Christianity in particular, what what's some of the kind of apologetic arguments that you like? Yeah, my, my main arguments um, are, are based on um, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That, that's my main interest. I know there's way more evidence than that. Um, but when we look at, for instance, the message of Christ, uh, we see that it's, it's a superior message to the other messages to the counterparts for instance the secular or religious counterparts in uh in the world when we, when we look at the uh morality of jesus we also see it's it's superior uh when, when you if you if you compare it from a philosophical or statistical point of view it's superior to other religions and um uh, to its secular counterparts and then when we look at the miracles of jesus which i know is one of your interests uh, the miracles of Jesus are also superior. Um, he, he did a lot of miracles, uh, including raising himself uh, from the dead, which I find very interesting because the Bible actually says that the the Father raised him from the dead. In another passage, it says the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. And then in other areas, it says he himself raised himself from the dead. So I think the resurrection of Jesus Christ is probably at the center of apologetics. Uh, because as we know, as believers, that if you can disprove the resurrection, then we can all go home uh, because Christianity doesn't exist. Everything rests on the resurrection of Jesus. That's what the Apostle Paul said. If Christ did not rise, then our faith is in vain. 
All right. All right. Cool. So, okay. Well, what about on the other end then? Because obviously, look, there are arguments against God's existence. The you know the hiddenness of God, the problem of evil, stuff like that. Arguments against Christianity. What do you make of um, apologetics' role for answering these kinds of things? Yeah. Again, from my perspective, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm an observer. I have an interest in it. I, I've watched quite a few debates with the new atheists like Sam Harris, uh, Lawrence Krauss, the late Christopher Hitchinson, and Richard Dawkins. Um, and, and when they debate their counterparts, whether it's John Lennox or William Lane Craig or, or others, mm -hmm. um, I always find that the Christian arguments, and this might be a little bit of bias, but even when they do, um, when they analyze some of these debates from a popular perspective, you always see people favoring the arguments of the uh, Christian apolo apologists. Uh, I just find their arguments are uh, more reasonable, more logical. I, I personally believe it takes more faith um, to believe in some of the arguments that the new atheists present uh, on, on issues of evil, on issues of God's existence. Um, I find a lot of their arguments are very shallow. They they resort to um, abuse, name calling, defamation, intimidation, harassment. Kind of ironic. I'm yeah. laughing because uh, I mean I've seen Christopher Hitchinson do it. I mean um, Sam Harris as well, and Lawrence Krauss, where they they <laughs> make fun of people. We're idiots. We're stupid. But there's no one that can believe this. But I mean that statement alone. Is the most idiotic statement you can make because the people they're debating are just as qualified as they are or more so uh from a educational point of view i mean these are people teaching at high levels um all over the world whether it's at oxford or princeton or harvard um and, and so i just find it very ironic that they they contradict themselves over and over again their arguments to me are very shallow and superficial all they can do is make fun of the christian faith and you know a part of me agrees I, I laugh with them and i agree yeah miracles are silly they're, they're, it, they can't happen uh but if god exists and anything can happen right so i i just i think they're arguing the wrong thing i think we need to argue god's existence not whether miracles exist because if god exists by definition i remember in school the definition of god is he can do anything so we're, we're really arguing i think the wrong thing when they argue miracles or they argue the issue of evil or uh, Christian abuses why don't we argue the issue if God exists and anything's possible that's a yeah that's an interesting yeah. point I, I remember my debate with an atheist uh, Jordan who I actually like he's not kind of that typical angry atheist online yeah. stuff like that but he was saying the same thing he's like okay look it boils down if you've got God you've got a mechanism so let's debate does God exist or something like that so but yeah, there's there doesn't seem to be that same recognition on the other end where you know oh they just want to mock and deride miracles as quote unquote magic and superstitions and stuff like that. There there is that anti supernatural bias that a lot of the the skeptics seem to have, and it's it's not really warranted. It's not well thought out on a lot of their parts. Um, one thing I, I do want to ask you is, well, in terms of approach, my old atheist uh, co-host, when I was on the Skeptics and Seekers podcast, he he purposefully employed a polemical approach where, you know, mocking, belittling Christianity kind of, and he saw that as a tactic on his part to expose how, you know, how silly it is or something like that. Do, do you think that for Christians doing apologetics, is there ever a appropriate time for us to use polemics or something like that or uh yeah, yeah is there any value in that approach i think, I think that's a i think that's a good question i think jesus used it mm -hmm. with his critics with the pharisees um he engaged in, in name calling to a certain extent um so I, th so I think i think there is a place for it um but i, I just see that when you resort to personal attacks or name calling or defamation uh, or ridiculing mocking that would be the word th then it weakens your argument it shows that you are, have become defensive and that your arguments are deficient because we're i think it was charles spurgeon who said that we should use 
uh, very soft words and very strong arguments, right? And, and yeah. John Lennox really does that. So when I see John Lennox debate some of the new uh, atheists, they sort of get mad and upset and start attacking, and he's calm and relaxed, having a good time, and and, and he is displaying that he possesses a superior temperament or superior personality or, or self-control than his atheist counterpart who who have to resort to, you know, Name derogatory uh, means, right? Um, it just shows that he, he's smiling, he's comfortable, it doesn't bother him, that he doesn't have to lower himself to their standards, to their, uh, I want to use the word perverted, but uh, <laughs> standards, uh, because it, it is, it's, 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 a, it's a form of perverted behavior, right? Abusive behavior. He doesn't have to resort to that. He can give, smile back, have a good attitude, uh, sort of love them as they're hating him, but he's loving them back, right? He's killing them with love. That's the way I see it. So that's why he's one of my favorite apologists because uh, he, 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 he doesn't get upset. He just returns love and gives really strong arguments that I think are much more superior. So it's not only his temperament, his personality, but his arguments are superior. Uh, and he's debated like, like, you know, like big shots like Christopher Hitchinson. And I think he's won. Like, I think I try, I try to remove myself. If I wasn't a Christian, if I was an agnostic, who, 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 who did the better job? And I think John Lennox, hands down. Like, he, he's not as famous or household name as Christopher Hitchinson. But I, I think he, he's more intelligent than him, for sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. he, 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 he has, um, he, he's a better debater, and he's more winsome. He, yeah. he, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm attracted to someone like that as opposed to Christopher Richardson. The guy looks like he's, you know, falling apart, you know? Um, yeah. and, and I guess he was because he was sick at the end. I'm not trying to put him down, uh, but he did live a, a lifestyle of um, a very, how should I say, hard lifestyle. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I totally. Yeah. He just it's, he looks the word I'm trying to I'm not trying to put them down to shovel. Is that the word word? Yeah. Sick with with, um, with uh, Richard Dawkins. Right. They look like they're madmen. Right. Sometimes when they're going after these Christian apologists. Now, I'm not stereotyping because then you have on the other hand, you have Sam Harris, who's very well put together. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, he's also very mean spirited. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and so forth. And my cat's me on in the background. So <laughs> no, no problem. No. Yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying and stuff like that. And um, like like you said, too, I, I do think that there is a place for it, but we have to be very careful and discerning because for the most part, for most people, including myself, it, when it's just given as a first tactic, it's very um, stand, it turn off. It turns me off. Like, I don't you know, you have nothing really valuable to say. You just want to insult and belittle and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I totally agree that our first approach is to be the Christ-like example where, you know, we come across it, uh, well and represent him well and that sort of thing. The only time I would see polemics working is in certain contexts where it's appropriate. So, for example, David Wood with Islamic uh apologetics they respect kind of a harsher stance right. and that sort of thing so yeah there, there are situations where it's called for if someone's entrenched uh, has a hard hardness of heart but for the most part we want to represent that john lennox style so all right cool all right cool so so let's get to your favorite topic then on the dis disability theology and this is something that i've never uh, really gotten into a lot. Uh, I don't think I've ever covered it on my show. So yeah. do you want to just take some time to, okay, what exactly is disability theology? Um, yeah. Well, before we get to disability theology, um, sure. like I'm no longer actively um, running events or organizations related to disability theology. I'm sort of retired from all that, but okay. I did it for many, many years. So I'll give you a little bit of my background. I, I, I worked with people with intellectual disabilities, like Kimu Living Toronto. So traditionally, um, in the Western Hemisphere, we've had what they call institutions for people with severe disabilities, like physical disabilities or intellectual disabilities, right? People that can't um, live on their own 
in, in, in within the community. So, for instance, in the province of Ontario, at one point uh, before Dalton McGinty, we had like over 30 institutions all across. So, for instance, if you had a child with a severe disability that was um, aggressive or hurting themselves, um, the doctors would tell you you had to put them in one of these institutions. And you didn't really have a choice. Mm. Um, and then in modern times, because of the rights movement, um then people started speaking up saying well people with disabilities should also have rights like everybody else is, has rights so they're being abused and, and in many cases that that was the case in these institutions uh over, just, me over just, medicated yeah go ahead just uh, just for context because my audience they're not canadians they have no idea who M M uh dalton mcguilty is oh. uh, um, what, so this is around like the 2000s or something, right? Um, yeah, he's the one that closed, shut them down, but it was progressively happening, right? So yeah. now all over the world, um, in developed countries, you would have very few institutions open. I think some still exist for people with severe disabilities or a danger to themselves. So now they've, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? I want to get the proper word. It's... Um, Deinstitutionalize people with uh, disabilities or severe mental health uh, diagnosis. So mm -hmm. you might notice now that you, you see a lot more people in the community that are physically disabled or have mental health disabilities. Or in the past, before the 1990s, they, most of them would be in these massive uh, institutions, right? So when the rights movement came along, uh, it affected uh, the disabled community uh, in a good way, but there's also a bad side to it, um, where if you give rights to people that can't manage or who are violent within community, then you, you get you develop all kinds of other problems, right? Yep. And, and, and when you talk to police officers, they're the first ones to tell you that, right? That ha over 90% of their calls are related to severe mental health issues or disabilities. Um, so, so this is the other problem is that we don't have the support staff if they're living within the community to control them. A, a lot of the, for instance, shootings in the States are related to this as well, mm -hmm. where, you know, you're giving guns to people with disabilities, with mental health disabilities. Uh, and and we, we know where that can lead, right? There's been a couple cases here in, in Canada um, as well, where in the past, these people would have been locked up, so they would have not had access to guns or vehicles to run over people. Mm -hmm. um, so this is where we're sort of at, sort of weighing, you know, yes, people with disabilities have rights, but then going too far, giving rights to people who are violent or maybe schizophrenic who one day they're okay, but if they're off their medication, they may rent a van, like hap what happened in, in, in Toronto, and, and run over people, That's right? Great. So yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a balance game, right? Uh, and it's not working in our favor. It's 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 actually uh, people are calling it now a mental health crisis, right? There's, there's also a drug crisis. It's all related, right? We didn't have that in the past. Why? Because these people were controlled within a mental health institution. So every person has to basically come to where where do they stand on this, right? Like yeah, there were abuse in these mental institutions, but for the most part. Uh, these people were there to protect them from themselves and to protect society. Now they're living amongst us and it's created all kinds of problems. So that's a little bit of, of the background where society's at. Um, mm -hmm. And then the church sort of has stepped in. Every large church has what we call a, a, a special needs ministry um, because people with disabilities now are visible within the community, right? Whereas, um, they were not in the past because they were in institutions. Now they live in group homes or support or uh, within the community. So now the church has had to play a role. Now these people with disabilities start coming to church. What what do we do, right? So the whole um, process of accessibility, not just physical accessibility, but also being ac accessible or welcoming spiritually or emotionally, right? Um, so again, it, it becomes a shock when a group home, for instance, of 10 people with intellectual disabilities, some have physical disabilities as well, 
uh, would show up at a church? How, how do we deal with um, maybe the noise level or their expressions of worship? They look a little bit different. They don't have the social etiquette that you and I may have. They're going to come up to you and give you a big hug and kiss. How do you deal with that? You, 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 I mean, we're not used to that, right? That's not uh, etiquette, right? Yeah. So it's created challenges for the church, but um, support staff with in the church where believers have stepped up and they started special needs ministry. So special needs ministries are relatively a new thing mm. based upon what's happened with society where now people with disabilities are, are living amongst us and they do have the right to live amongst us, in my opinion, as long as they're not a danger to themselves and to society. I think that's where you have to draw the line. Um, and, and, and the government is not doing a good job of drawing that line, right? They're, yeah. they're saying that everybody has a right and and we'll, we'll deal with the consequences after the fact, which is not being proactive. So that's a little bit of the background um, there. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about what the Bible actually says about uh, yeah, disability theology, but that's the cultural background. And then the church has stepped up to the plate, especially bigger churches with special uh -huh. needs ministries, right? Which, yeah. which is fantastic. Uh, again, the danger with special needs ministries, though, is some of them tend to segregate people with disabilities into their own classes, hmm. right? And so now there's a move for inclu inclusion within the church now. So not to have them within their own class, but integrated within the Sunday school, within, um, right, within yeah. the, the congregation so they can worship, so they can, uh, Let me. yeah. That makes sense to me, but just biblically speaking. Like, look, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither disabled yeah. nor abled, whatever yeah. it is, right? We're all one in Christ, so that makes yeah. sense. And one of my, when we talk a little bit now about disability um, theologians, um, one of the fascinating things that, uh, I'm not a disability theologian, theo theologian mm -hmm. um, but I am a disability advocate. That's my recognition. Um, so we started can i go back a little bit to my background of course yeah yeah okay so okay, backtrack a little bit so I, I took you where the culture's at where the church is at so when i was in bible college um i started working with people with disabilities i think i mentioned community in toronto but there's probably a hundred organizations like that um christian horizons would be probably one of the largest ones out there that's christian based or evangelical based so the, the founder had a child with a disability. They started Christian Horizons. So they, they basically have group homes, right? So, yeah. so you, you live in a condo, Dale, so they might have a condo next door to you that they rent or bought, and, mm -hmm. and a group of people with disabilities live there with the support staff, that, that concept. But it could also be a home, right? But they yeah. do buy a lot of um, a lot of these organizations, buy a lot of units and condos, right? So sometimes they have a whole floor, right? Uh, and again, it's the whole concept of integration, which never existed before. Um, commu community living, that's what they call it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, where was I going with this? So now you have all these organizations to support people with disabilities within the community. Uh, and, and they have staff going into the group homes. Uh, but the interesting part is that as flawed and uh, what I like to call imperfect and degenerating human beings like physically we're degenerating right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so disabilities just the term disability means impairment or it means a limitation so we all have that so in the general sense we're all disabled right um yeah. so we have something called visible disabilities invisible disabilities so some disabilities you can't see because they're um cognitive or mental health right they're minor or mm -hmm. people suffer from depression you can hide that or from mild forms of autism right you you can hide some of that stuff right um yeah. right but physical disabilities is harder to hide right you're in a wheelchair you have a cane right but there's something called dual diagnosis where you have both right so you have the unfortunate uh unfortunate um place in your life to be physically disabled, you're in a wheelchair, but you also maybe have an intellectual or learning disability or mental health disability, right? So what I'm trying to get at is that all of society, every human being has a disability at one level or another. Then we have aging disabilities. So as we get older, we know that, you know, our hearing goes, our eyesight goes, those are all forms of disabilities. They're, they're I, limitations, impairments, right? Can I just but, jump in just yeah. to ask you to add to what you're saying and I'll let yeah. you finish, but 
Um, what What's your take on maybe the third class of disabilities that never gets attention is spiritual disabilities? Look, oh, I, 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 actually, we do talk yeah. about that. You just beat me. To, you just beat me to it. Absolutely, we're we're spiritually disabled because we're disconnected from God. We're broken, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and sin has disabled all of us, right? Death is the greatest disability. So, uh, related to that, there, there's a book that your audience needs to know. It's probably the top book on uh, disability theology. She's passed away now at the age of 44. She was in a wheelchair. She, she was a disability the theologian. She passed away several years ago. Her name is Nancy Eastland. So the name is spelled E-I-E-S-L-A-N-D. And she wrote a book that is probably the most famous book out there uh, that became more mainstream called The Disabled God. And it was very controversial. So the book is called The Disabled God by Nancy Eastland. And, and she's you, passed on that. But she was a disability theologian. Yeah. It's a fantastic book that I think everybody should read. So it's controversial because it talks about how Jesus, who is the God-man, when he came into this world, actually became disabled because he 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 faced all the disabilities, the sicknesses, right? The limitations that we as human beings have, right? Mm -hmm. um, then she talks a lot about him being on the cross. He would have been physically disabled by the the beaten the, 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 the scourging and the beatings that he, he underwent right he, he he appears to thomas we're talking about evidence apologetics right and interesting enough the scars were still there on his side and on his wrist right <laughs> someone walking down the street with scars on their body you would say that someone has a physical deformity or physical disability so okay. it's kind of controversial but I think the point can be made that Christ, when he came into this world, limited himself and, and took on our physical disabilities, right? Um, Let, can I ask you kind yeah. of a, a follow-up question? It's a bit of a challenge. I just want to see your take. It's a yeah. challenge to this notion of a disabled God. Um, I think, I, so I hear what you're saying. During Jesus' time of humiliation, he had a 100% human nature. He yeah. was subject to all the pains and, and pleasures that every other human being is. But I'm not sure that I, it's right to call him disabled because he was, he was able, he had the ability to gain the abilities back if he wanted. He was willing not to have those full divine abilities in a, in a sense, right? So he was still omnipotent. Uh, yeah. But he chose not to exercise it. So if somebody objects on that front and says, well, he, he's, he is able, but he's just not using those abilities. Um, right. A, yeah. Which, yeah. It's, yeah. No, I think that's a legitimate point. That God is perfect. So if God is perfect, how can he be disabled? But we're talking about the God man. We're not mm -hmm. talking about God the Father or God the Holy Spirit. We're talking about Jesus. He, he would have, his body would have faced it was his spirit that was perfect, that was divine, but his body was 100% human. So he would have got sick, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. He, he yep. could have got depressed, right? That's a mental health disability. Yep. We don't know for sure, but right? But yep. if his body is 100% human, I mean, he could have lost an arm or leg, right? He could have, he could have had all the disabilities, right? He could have yep. had problems with his eyesight. We don't know that for sure. We're just speculating mm -hmm. or, or a, a hearing problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and he probably did when they, when they smacked him in the face, right? That probably did some neurological damage right so yeah. that's why i said it's controversial when yeah. that book for, when that book first came out it, it, it's still controversial the disabled god you don't refer to god that way so we're talking about the god man jesus who sub, like you well said his humiliation would have um, in his body faced exactly what we, we could have faced cool so in that sense yeah but that's probably the most popular book out there the, the, there's others. I mean, Brian Brook wrote a book, Wondrously Wounded. Uh, John uh, Winton, Finding Jesus in the Storm, The Spiritual Lives of Christians with Mental Health Challenges. So these are dis disability theologians as well. But N Nancy Eastman, uh is probably the one of the best known. Um, I, I have to tell you about a friend of mine. I just have to get it in there. His name is Dr. Neil Cudney, and he is... Um, he works for Christian Horizons. He also teaches now disability theology at Tyndale. So mm -hmm. that's recent that he was able to 
sort of convince them. So you can actually go to Tyndale University here in Toronto and, and take a course on uh, disability theology. So not, not every seminary or Bible college would offer that, by the way. Yeah. So, awesome. yeah. Okay. Well, la last question. Uh, we, again, we are limited time. It's 10 AM. So this will be my last question yeah. for you. And so you've kind of talked about disability theology again, which is totally new to me and my audience. So this is great. Um, something new to consider. And you've, you've told us about, okay, from within the church, how are we supposed to deal with uh, people that have disabilities? Now, what about people outside the church? You know, we're trying to share the gospel with people that have disabilities that aren't already believers. Um, is there any differences in how we're supposed to share the gospel message with unbelievers who are disabled? Yeah, so that's a very good point because there's two philosophies that seem to be at odd uh, within the secular community um, where some people are would say we have to embrace our disability, that we have limitations. And then there's other people like Rick Hansen, who, you know, he's in a wheelchair. He went to the Special Olympics and did very well. Sort of, it's what they call the, 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 the superhero, right? Mm -hmm. you, yeah. So your disability actually gives you an edge over people without disabilities, right? You, you, you are uh, it's like more, 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 more courageous, more, you know what I mean? You're, you're a stronger person because of your disability, right? Some mm -hmm. people don't like that, that they equate their disability with sort of this superhero mentality that, you know, you can do, you can do anything. You can get in a wheelchair, but some people can't, right? So you gotta mm -hmm. be careful, and even within the church, uh, that some people with disabilities, they, they want, I wouldn't say to wallow in their disability or have a pity party, but to acknowledge it and to acknowledge their limitations, that they can't do everything, right? I think you have to balance the two because there are people with disabilities that are very able. We have the late, who was a friend of mine, David Onley, who became Canada's first uh, anchorman uh, for CP24 with, a, with he had polio, with a, he was in a wheelchair, right? With a physical disability, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So, but he he was very able, right? But he could not run a marathon, right? He told me personally, he his dream as a child was to be an astronaut, and mm -hmm. and, and you know he was he was actually quite knowledgeable, not an expert on that issue, right? Of space and NASA, uh, and uh, but he couldn't because of his polio, right? So he was limited. But he became an anchorman. Then he became, as we all know, the lieutenant, uh, lieutenant governor of Ontario, right? And he was one of the best lieutenant governors of Ontario. And he championed disability rights and accessibility and inclusion. So, again, from one perspective, yeah, he's a superhero. I couldn't do what he did. I couldn't be the lieutenant governor. I couldn't be an anchorman, right? But then from the other perspective, his dream of being an astronaut was, was squashed because of his of his polio. So I think we, we got to be sensitive to each individual. Um, yeah. But Dale, I, 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 my real heart it's good to know what's going on in the community, but is what the Bible actually says. The, the Bible is filled <coughs> with examples of disability. Do I have time to go, rattle yes. yep. the facts off? Okay, so first of all, like we all know Moses, right? Mm -hmm. The Bible yeah. tells us that he had a, a, he was sold to speech. So he probably had a stuttering disability or speech disability. That's in Exodus 4. Then we all know the story of Samson, that he was blind, but God mm -hmm. used him, right, in Judges 16. Then we know about, about a guy named, uh, and I'm probably going to say his name wrong, uh, uh, Mephishosef, I think it is. He was crippled in 2 Samuel 4, um, right? Mm -hmm. Then we, we hear about Nebuchadnezzar. He had a mental, he suffered from mental illness. We hear, we know about Jeroboam's hand that withered and was restored, Nahum's leprosy. And then we have other examples of leprosy in the New Testament. Jacob, who wrestled with the Lord, he walked with a limp, right? So that would be in a physical disability. We come in the New Testament, we find uh, find out about a very interesting guy named Zacchaeus, right? We have whole shows on television now called uh, Little People, Big World, whatever, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, they would call themselves little people, right? So yeah. he, he would have had a disability uh, uh, there. Um, we look at, uh, for instance, the Apostle Paul, where it says he had a thorn in the flesh. Theologians believe that was an eyesight, right? He had a problem with his, with his vision, right? So it was a vision disability. And, you know, uh, so the, there's examples in the Bible. Out of Jesus' 21 miracles, he healed people with disabilities. One of my favorite passages is in Matthew 11, where John's in prison. 
the, and he sends his disciples to go find Jesus. And John's disciples ask Jesus, how would we know that you're the Messiah? And Jesus says, well, go back and tell my cousin John what you've seen. The, the, the lame walk, the blind see, you know, the poor being fed. So he healed people with disabilities, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we hear him in John 9 healing a person that was blind, right? There's other cases where he heals the lame and the blind, even people that have, were dead, right? Like Lazarus, yeah. right? And yeah. He brings them back to life. And so, like, his whole ministry was basically surrounded with people with disabilities. It actually says that he actually became, and this is part of apologetics, is that it, it is, is that Jesus was a celebrity. Mm. There were thousands, not hundreds, thousands of people following him, right? And that's pretty hard to say he didn't exist when thousands of people, are, when he's going from town to town to town, and they're bringing their sick family members or friends for Jesus to touch and heal. I mean... That, that's a huge case for for apologetics because um, it wasn't hundreds, it was thousands. Uh, he fed the 5,000, right? And that was just men. So it was probably 10,000, right? Oh, uh, um, yeah. So he, he, he was like a celebrity today. He was well known. Um, there were hundreds and thousands of eyewitnesses to his miracles. Um, and, and the interesting part, uh, and the passage is eluding me now, but it'll come to me eventually, is where... Jesus said that those people who reject our message, okay, they reject it. If they reject it, then you go out and bring in the lame and the blind and bring them in to my house, to my mm -hmm. banquet, right? So mm -hmm. we're, we're commanded to physically go out and invite the, the disabled to come to God's banquet, to God's house, to invite them to, to, to receive the gospel, right? And mm -hmm. lastly, I'll say this, which is very powerful, is that we, we know that Jesus um use miracles to authenticate his his message or, or himself as the god man mm -hmm. it's very important to understand that and you brought it up and that's i guess where we need to end is spiritual disabilities that the whole human race is spiritually disabled or were impaired were were limited we don't see properly where jesus when he healed someone in john 9 of a physical disability, blindness, physical blindness, he equated that to spiritual blindness. He says, okay, this guy's physically disabled, but you guys are spiritually blind, which is worse, right? Exactly. Yeah. Because you're denying me. You're denying who I am, right? And so yeah. I think that's what we, we would say to the new atheists and to skeptics is, according to Jesus, not according to Dale and Jamie, you're spiritually blind. You, you have the greatest disability because that disability will disconnect you from God for eternity. Yeah, exactly. And, and I just want to add one last thing to that is that we have all kinds of secular studies that show that people of faith, people that worship, people that pray, people that believe in the things we believe, live superior lives as far as happiness and purpose and even health than, than our secular counterparts. So that's that's very interesting as well when it comes to apologetics, right? Yeah, you know, uh, when you were reading the Bible, I, I so the, just a couple couple last things kind of yeah. thing. One one thing that kind of struck me is that okay, based on how Jesus and uh, God treats disabilities, you remember you were kind of talking about in the secular world there are these two fundamental philosophical schools: those who embrace their disabilities and and say like this is a good thing, it it, it makes me Superman or something like that, um, versus the others who are kind of look, I'm just acknowledging I've got this and, and there's a limitation. It sounds to me like, yeah, that disabilities are not a good thing in and of themselves. Jesus heals them, right? It's it's not the original design plan, but at the same time, we live in a fallen world. So we need to be realistic and acknowledge yeah. that. And, yeah. and, you, and, and to add to that point, uh, there's all kinds of scriptures, which maybe we can do a separate segment on, is that through our weakness, we are strong. So, exactly. and Jesus said, I came for the sick, not for the healthy. So in that sense, disability is very good that we acknowledge our disabilities or, or physical limitations, our spiritual limitations, know that we cannot, no, we, we don't have the ability to self-identify because that's God's characteristics. That's God's attribute, right? Exactly. Only that's God can self-identify, right? That's a, so, um, that's so exactly what we, we need to acknowledge that we're disabled, that we can't come to God on our own, that we can't uh, earn our own salvation, that we're, that we're broken. So disabilities is 
directly connected to the gospel, where we have to acknowledge that we're a sinner. It's basically acknowledging that we're disabled. We're disabled. We've been disabled from God. It's sort of like you're plugged into your computer and you unplug the plug. We're disabled, and only God can plug it back in, right? Right. Yeah. And then we, you know, we. Yeah. Obviously, I, there's still our, our our choice to respond to that, yeah. but He initiates it. I to I totally agree that that so you said it better than me. That's what I was trying to get is that look, uh, there, it not it's not intrinsically good, but it's instrumentally good for the purpose that you well, said. You yeah, but God, God, God uses. Remember the verses where it says God uses He turns our ashes into beauty. Exactly. Yep. What was meant for our, so it, it's it's like it's almost like reverse psychology where it is bad, but God because He's God has the ability to take what is bad and turn it into good. It, there's even a verse in the Bible that's mind-boggling that says Paul gloried, he celebrated his infirmities, his disabilities, his weaknesses, right? There's another passage where it says that God honors the weaker members of the body more than the stronger members. Why? Because yeah. he wants us to come as weak. Because that when we come as weak, then his power can flow through us. If we come through self-righteousness and our own strength, then God can't flow through us because pride blocks that. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah. We're, we're not Superman. We're not. We, we can't do it on our own. Right. So yeah. I think the three yeah. things they, they are that I, I, I've never really connected them as we have today, that really abuse and disability and um, apologetics, they really go together. Absolutely. All right. Cool. So uh, no, there's no audience questions, but uh, the audience was enjoying the show and stuff. But I just want to ask you one last question yeah. that we will take off, I promise. But um, modern miracle healings, um, what's your take on it? Do you think that God still miraculously heals people today? Or is that something that was only during the time of Jesus? Uh, what's your uh, quick take on that? Well, I'll, I'll answer it from a, 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 I'll play the devil's advocate and I'll pretend I'm a skeptic. Okay. Right. So okay. I'll say from a skeptic point of view, like an honest skeptic. I'm not talking about people who are intellectually dishonest, right? Because mm -hmm. that leads to abuse too, right? <laughs> um, is that if you're if you're an honest, intellectually honest skeptic or atheist or agnostic, whatever the case is, you would have to admit, based on not Christian studies, secular studies, right? Yeah. That uh, medical mysteries happen. I mean, just I think last time I checked, twelve shows on television talking about. Uh, the unknown or the unexplained. I think he's Canadian. William Shatner does a show on that. The unexplained, right? Yeah. Uh, there's all kinds of shows on TV and ta talking about uh, the paranoia. These guys are going to haunted houses with all the gadgets, right? Or farms, right? Mm -hmm. and, and detecting uh, different noises and uh, things of that sort. So there's all kinds of shows where our culture embraces that. The unknown, the unexplained. I mean, aliens, you know, we can get into that one day. That's fascinating as well. Aliens and uh, UFOs, right? A, a lot of believers believe those are fallen angels, right? Yeah. Um, that are doing like their business. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So our our culture acknowledges all that. And we just happen to call it miracles. They call it the unexplained, the unknown, paranormal, uh, whatever, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Medical mystery. So they, they acknowledge. Uh, so that's what I find very ironic that people like Christopher Hitchinson, Sam Harris... They're not intellectually honest because they they will acknowledge it. They just call it something different, right? And we as believers would also acknowledge with them. We agree with them. This is something I always say that uh, believers and skeptics or atheists have in common. We we agree with Christopher Hitchinson and Sam Harris and and Richard Dawkins, Lawrence Krauss that miracles in the natural are impossible. That they're foolish. It's it's ridiculous. It it, it doesn't happen. Of course yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about the supernatural. So let's debate the real thing. Does God exist? See, if he exists, then anything's possible, right? So that's why I, I, I end it, that there's categorical evidence for miracles from a secular perspective. We just happen to call it something different. Awesome. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. This was uh, an awesome interview, and I'm sure I'll have you back on to discuss stuff like this in more detail in, in the future and stuff. Did, did you enjoy your time on, on your end there? Or? Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're a great host. Uh, I, I definitely want to talk about your subject, which uh, I was, me and my son were actually uh, looking at it last night, which um, is a sh shot of Turan. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. 
So yeah, I, I, can I just put one plug in or do we have to go? No, go, go. It, yeah. I'm just so ending for we you. We were watching one documentary and I forget who the people are. You would know that they actually said they found dirt and they traced that dirt on Jesus' nose, uh, knees, and somewhere else, I think, on the body. Uh, and it traced it back to the first century, which I was like, wow, that's, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't think so. They haven't dated. It's on the, uh, the bottoms of his feet as well. They haven't yeah, dated. Yeah, that's, that's it, yeah. Uh, they can't date the the dirt, obviously, right? But it's yeah. what they what they do is they link it to Jerusalem. This yeah, 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 yeah. dust that's in Calvary areas, right? And the, yeah, the limestone and all that kind of stuff. It's yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, if yeah. you want to, you're welcome on my show to talk about the shroud anytime for sure. Yeah, so. well, I'm not I'm not an expert. I would be an observer, but <laughs> okay, I, I find it fascinating because you know what? I was a skeptic, right? Because I I always believed in that carbon dating, right? Yeah. Right. Which we know now that that it's that, yeah, yeah, it's been falsified. I mean, e even Oxford Labs, one of the labs that dated it in 1988, they've come out and said the dating was wrong. We can't rely on it. Well, the, the thing we heard last night was that they repaired it during the medieval times, right? Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. to repair it, they actually put like their own cloth and they dyed it to sort of match uh, the the older cloth. So around a lot. Around the edges of it, because it was deteriorating, they actually repaired it and weaved it in, sold it in with cloth, cotton cloth from the medieval time, and they dyed it. So you, with the human eye, you can't tell the difference. So that's what they were dating is the repairs with the cotton cloth that they used during the medieval times. But yeah. obviously, if they did right in the middle, it would destroy it, right? But the dates, it, it's different. It's linen in the middle. It's cotton in the It's different material. Yeah, there's, so there's definitely so that's the my friend Joe Marino. He's invented yeah. this invisible reweave hypothesis, and I think this is the most popular theory. I myself disagree with it, believe it or not. I go yeah. for Bob Rucker's neutron absorption explanation. So neutrons were irradiated it. Um, now that's a supernatural explanation versus a natural one. But yeah, the definitely the invisible reweave is something that you have to take seriously. It, there has been cotton proven to be in that section, and it's not representative to the rest of the cloth and stuff like that. So. Yeah, it's just I just found it fascinating. Maybe I'll take it up. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, cool. I would I, I would love to welcome you to the shroud crowd. So yeah, I'll, <laughs> um, I'll be called a shroudy. There you go, a shroudy. Yep. <laughs> All right, Dale. All right, yeah. thank you so Thanks, much, buddy. Jake. Take care. All right, take care, everyone, and uh, have a great week. Just so everyone knows, I will be on S.J. Thomason's channel next Friday um, discussing Walter McCrone and the painting hypothesis for the Shroud of Turin. So tune into that. But otherwise, have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.